Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we are here to talk about the evolution of flight, exploring online classroom interactive tools. So for those of you who haven't used the Zoom platform before, I just want to give you a quick introduction. So uh, you should be seeing my screen full on your screen. We do recommend that you exit the full screen so that you can see the chat window. We will be doing a lot of interactive activities today, so you'll want to have access to that window. Uh, you can find that by going to options up here and selecting exit full screen or sometimes hitting the escape button will work. Um, and that will allow you to dock the chat window on the side. So if you can't find your chat window, it should just say chat up here. Um, but it might also, you might see a dot, dot, dot for more, and you might need to click that to get to the chat. Um, and that way you can converse with everyone. So we want to make sure that you are selecting everyone from the panel here. Otherwise, Nobody else will be able to see your responses and we won't be able to have a conversation together. So please make sure that you're selecting everyone or all participants. All right, looks like a number of folks can hear me okay. Great, wonderful. So let's test out that chat window. Why don't you um, go ahead and share in the chat window where you're from and what your role is and as an educator. And again, make sure that you're sending to everyone. We have Phoebe from Connecticut. Kelly from St. Louis, Andrea from Indiana, got STEM educators, pre-K teachers, K through eight, middle school, environmental educator. Awesome. Ohio, Florida, hi Sandy. In British Columbia, nice. <laughs> Minnesota, awesome. Love the Twin Cities. From Autobahn Center in Vermont, that's awesome. Welcome, Luke from Connecticut, biology teacher. <laughs> This is great. What a great group of people. Lots of different ranges of uh, education, educator types and age ranges. Hopefully you'll find something for everybody in this webinar. So let's go ahead and jump in. So I'm coming to you live tonight from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. Uh, this is the lab building here. Unfortunately, it doesn't exactly look like that today. Uh, please imagine, if you will, a frozen lake and a four or five more inches of snow. <laughs> it's been chilly out recently, but it has been beautiful. Oh, the trade-offs. <laughs> so I'm from the Bird Sleuth K through 12 group. My name is Kelly Schaefer. I'm the education specialist, and I'm joined today by my partner in crime, Lindsay Glasner, who is our outreach coordinator. And here at Bird Sleuth, our mission is to create innovative K through 12 resources that build science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. So basically what we do is we take all of the really cool stuff that the lab is doing and we package it for educators and make sure that you all know that it's out there for you to use. In this webinar, we'll be looking at a number of things. Uh, we'll be looking at features that make birds unique. We'll be talking about feathers. We'll be looking at the Flap to the Future game that helps us explore the evolution of flight and the lessons that accompany it. 
and also checking out some other really cool resources from our Bird Academy website. All of these resources are available to you for free. Um, they do require access to the internet for most of them. Well, for all of them. <laughs> and uh, uh, their Bird Academy, I think, is one of the fastest growing parts of the lab that people still don't really know about. So I'm excited to have the opportunity to share some of these resources with you tonight. So let's go ahead and start talking about flight. I love thinking about birds and flight. I think flight is one of those things that uh, draws people in and attracts them to birds and bird watching. Um, you can see in this picture of an American kestrel uh, that he's actually got a passenger along for his flight that probably isn't nearly as excited about flying as the kestrel is. Um, but this is one of those things that makes watching birds dynamic. It makes them great educational tools. Um, and that's something that really speaks to a lot of folks um, in their own you know, inner desires, that dream of flight. So flight is a really powerful and awesome thing. And it's just so fascinating how flight evolved. So we're going to be talking about a number of these things tonight. Um, and flight, uh, and to talk about flight and the evolution of flight, we have to understand some terms together. So let's talk first about adaptations. So adaptations are things that help an organism survive or reproduce in its environment. So they improve its fitness. Um, they are produced by natural selection. So they are honed for the environment that the um, animal lives in. So the selection pressure helps refine these traits. Um, so they can be behavioral, structural, or physiological. And when it comes to birds, there's a number of different kinds of adaptations that you can see, um, even displayed in this humble mallard duck. So why don't you take a look at the mallard duck here pictured. Uh, we can focus on the, the drake or the male in the front with the green head. Um, and tell me some adaptations that you notice. Remember that adaptations can be behavioral, structural, physiological. They can be for survival or reproduction. Phoebe's noticing the shape of the bill and the coloring. Feet for paddling, webbed feet, webbed feet. Right coloring. Right head for mating. Awesome, Jessica, I was just about to ask. A couple people mentioned the coloring, but what could it be for? Kathy's talking about waterproofing. Yeah, you can see some of those feathers have water beads on them. A filtering bill. Oh, the body structure looks like something that would float. Yes, it has that lovely uh, rounded shape like the bottom of a canoe. Body shape. Body shape for floating. Awesome. Oh, yeah. So let's take a look. I think you guys did a really good job. Let's see how you did naming some adaptations. Wide flat bill, you guys definitely call that out. The colorful iridescent head feathers, the waterproof feathers, and the webbed feet. So these are just a few of the features on display here when we're looking at this mallard. Somebody mentioned eyes on the side, which is a really cool um, adaptation that a lot of um, critters that are prey have because it helps them have a wider range of, of sight of what's going on around them, whereas predators tend to have their eyes in front of their heads. Um, so that they can focus in on what they're catching and have the advantage of binocular vision. So you guys picked out a lot of awesome adaptations. And I love that you picked out the colorful iridescent head feathers and you recognize that they were for mating. So hey girl, check out my adaptations. Oh, and Phoebe's pointing out that the female that you can see behind the male is camouflage. So she has that um, lovely kind of earth tone colors and the breaking up of the speckles on her front and back, which break up her shape. Awesome. 
So adaptations. Um, what's really wonderful about adaptations, once you start to look for them, um, and once your students start to look for them, it can help identify uh, habitats. So you can start to recognize features that are common uh, across different habitats and start to recognize their functionality. So let's take a look at this great blue heron pictured in the center. Behind it, you see two habitats. Where do you think this great blue heron is adapted to? Which habitat? The one on the left or the one on the right? Right, I'm seeing, everybody's saying the right side. Some people's pointing out the fact that the right side has water. Um, somebody earlier said that the long legs for the water. Awesome, yeah. So along with those long legs that adapted to the water, you can see the long neck and beak, which help with uh, fishing in that habitat. Um, the picture on the right is actually from the Lab of Ornithology. There used to be a heron nest down on our pond behind the building. So that's always fun to watch them hunting on the pond. Let's take a look at another one. What about this bird? Which habitat do you think it is adapted to and why? Right, everybody's saying the right side because of camouflage and coloration. Some people are pointing out the, the legs, the longer legs, the body shape, because it looks like a rock. Yeah, absolutely. So this bird is a ruddy turnstone, and you can see that its coloration match, matches the rocks in this picture very well. Um, and also, some folks are pointing out the legs, which is a great observation. They're a little bit longer, which can really help with uh, being in a shore area where you do encounter some water. Awesome. Let's take a look at another good old rock pigeons. Which habitat do you think the rock pigeons evolved in? Left, 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 coloring, cliff dwellers, left, yes. Left because it's like a skyscraper, safety from predators. Yeah, absolutely, so you all are right on the button here. Our, our friendly neighborhood pigeons did evolve on cliff faces to breed on cliff faces. Um, and I love the connection that somebody made to them looking like skyscrapers because that's basically what pigeons think of skyscrapers. They think, hey, check out these awesome cliff faces for us to nest on. So um, they really did evolve in that sort of habitat. Andrew is pointing out that they are not opposed to being in the woods, and this is true. They are what I like to call to uh, highly adaptable birds. <laughs> but yes, awesome job. And then last but not least, we have our little friend, the Wilson's Warbler. If you had to make a guess about which habitat here. Oh, lots of good guesses. So, Lots of folks are saying left. One person points out that that beak is not going to be opening any pine cones anytime soon. But one person made a great observation too. Yes, this is a definitely an, a bill for insects. And a couple people are catching on that this bird is a migratory bird. So somebody said both, somebody said different seasons. So that is kind of the trick question here. Wilson's warbler is a migratory bird. On the left, you can see where it would spend its winter in the tropics. On the right, you can see where it spends its summer. So it wouldn't have snow on it at the time, but they do prefer these conifer forests in the summertime. 
So slightly trick question here, because this little guy is a migratory bird. But I love the observations that you made about the beak and how it's not fit for eating seeds, which is something that it would have to do if it were going to stay there in the winter, and that it is an insect beak, which is uh, why a lot of birds migrate, not so much to escape the cold, but to escape the lack of food that comes with the cold. And if you're an insect eater, that is especially true for you. So now let's move right along and focus on one of the things about birds, one of their adaptations that make them especially unique feathers. Here you'll see pictured two birds of paradise because they're some of the more spectacular instances of feathers. And I think they're beautiful, so I wanted to make you look at them. So let's chat for a second. Let's take a look at uh, this photo here. You'll see a bunch of different kinds of feathers and I'd love for you to brainstorm some ideas about what feathers do for birds. Oh, so many good answers coming in. I see attract mail. I see structure for flight. I see create airspace for insulation, camouflage, keep dry, allow it to fly, insulation, mating display. Somebody's asking, do birds need feathers to fly? What an interesting question. So you guys are hitting all of the main points. Nesting material. Birds do use feathers for nesting materials, occasionally their own. <laughs> Often they, you'll see um, things like tree swallows fighting for a nice white feather to line their nest with. Yeah, so you've picked out a number of uh, great adaptations, flight and display, waterproofing and camouflage, and the ever important insulation. So feathers serve a huge range of purposes for birds. Feathers allow them to survive on every continent um, and in such extreme things as swimming in the Antarctic waters. So feathers are very, very cool. Um, somebody was asking about feathers and whether they were necessary for flight. And the simple answer is absolutely yes. Um, feathers act as airfoils, so they provide lift. Um, and the tail feather of a bird will help it direct itself in flight, so it acts like a rudder. The feather that isn't there a bird that uses its feathers specifically for sound purposes? There is. There's a type of mannequin called a club-winged mannequin that uses its feathers to correct. Uh, excuse me, to create sound. So much like an insect that stridulates, um, these, um, these feathers are used in a mechanical way to make sound. And I think Lindsay's going to find a link to a video for you. And somebody's asking a question that I missed. Oh, Judy, maybe I misunderstood the comment. Yeah, so Judy's pointing out, what about insects? They don't have feathers and they can fly. Yes. Um, I guess I was answering that question from the perspective of birds. Could birds fly without feathers? And structurally, no, they couldn't. But insects, great point. Insects can fly without feathers. Bats can fly without feathers. Um, so in those cases, the membranes of the bat's wings act in much the same way as uh, the feathers of a bird's wing do. So they allow for uh, a wider surface area to create lift. Um, pretty awesome stuff. And insects, of course, they have incredible wings. They have two different types of flying. So there's things like uh, dragonflies that you can see their wings out on and things like grasshoppers and beetles who can fold their wings for flight. So yeah, different ways to achieve flight across the animal wor world for sure. <laughs> Sandy's pointing out that feathers make great calligraphy pens. And yes, they do. <laughs> 
And Luke, you're asking about winnowing. So yeah, feathers can make sound in other birds as well. That whistling sound when they fly off um, for snipes or morning doves, which we've all become familiar with too, I'm sure. And Lindsay just shared the club wing mannequin video. I highly recommend checking it out if you have a chance. And I think it's even featured. It's oh, I think it might even be featured in the Feather Interactive. Oh, so we'll have to check that out. And Phoebe's pointing out that owls have feathers that are designed for silence. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So lots of different awesome things here uh, for talking about with feathers. So these are the different kinds of feathers that you can find on a bird. The wing feathers are asymmetrical, which help with flight. So this is the leading edge here that cuts through the wind, and this is um, the trailing edge that is often overlapped. Here you can see a tail feather. Uh, they have a number of purposes. As we've learned, feathers can serve a number of purposes, and tails can do just about all of them, except for not so great with insulation. Um, but they can be like rudders in the air that allow birds to fly. A contour feather is, think of the, the breast feathers on that mallard duck that we saw that cover the, uh, the body or the contour of the body. Semi-plume and down feathers are great for um, insulation, and the semi-plumes often have a bit of color, um, and they might be peeking out through the contour feathers sort of thing, or might be on the belly of the bird. Lots of different um, there is an awesome online interactive that I'd like to share with you now. So I'm going to switch over to um, my browser window here. And there we go. Awesome. So Bird Academy, this is the website academy.allaboutbirds.org has a number of really, really awesome interactives. I can't share them with all with you today, but I do want to point out a few really useful ones to you. The images that we were just looking for at were from our All About Feathers module. This is a really awesome module to talk about feathers and learn about their purposes and structure. Um, here, I'm going to zoom through a couple things. You'll recognize this image here. Um, what's great is you can work through this information with students together. You can, if you have a one-to-one -one and you have the access to the technology, students can work through this information at their own pace and you can learn all sorts of great things about feathers. For instance, you can learn in-depth things about the feather structure. So you can learn about the tenacious region of the feather. You can learn about um, barbs and barbules and how these things stick together. Um, so here is, oops, I'm not sure what just happened. <laughs> my computer hates me. <laughs> I had to just shut down my browser. Okay, there we go. Awesome. Huzzah. <laughs> so you can see um, the rake is here, the barb, which is the first branching off from the center vein of the feather. And then the barbule, which is like the little zipper parts that hold the feather together. So you can learn all about feather structure in that way. Uh, it even goes on further to talk about the uses, which we've talked about through a flip, flip and guess game. You can look at the pictures here and guess what it's for. These are gorgeous asymmetrical flight feathers. So I'm going to say the flight feathers of a beautiful roseate spoonbill. And so you can learn about all these different things. Um, what's super cool is that it goes through the evolution of the feather too. So there's different modules. Um, this one talks about how feathers evolve. And this next section is the one that Lindsay oh, was yeah. actually talking about. This is the scientist who was studying club winged mannequins. Um, and there's, you can go through here and learn about the puzzle. You can see the birds and watch videos. So there's lots of really rich information here. Um, I wanna show you really quick a little bit with this one. I'm gonna skip through some of this because 
that's something you'll want to explore on your own time. But it does go through finding fossils and the clues from there. And then here's a clue from Feather Girls. And this is really cool because it actually, um, there were two schools of thought around feather evolution for a long time, one of which was the scale to feather theory and one of which was the filament to feather theory. And a little bit more than 10 years ago when I was taking evolution in college, the scale to feather theory was the uh, much more preferred theory or that's not quite the right way to say it was the dominant theory, I suppose, at the time um, that feathers came from scales that started to break down and branch out. But it turns out that more along the lines and because of fossil records, we're thinking it's the filament to feather theory these days, these hollow, flexible tubes. Because um, that's how feathers grow out of the skin. They come in pins in these sheaths that then break away. Um, and so this goes through that process of time and shows how feathers might have evolved the structure that they have today following the filament to feather theory. Um, and there's really awesome things in the, the fossil record that is supporting that these days. So I won't go too much more into that interactive, but I do want you to know that it's there um, and that there's lots of really awesome stuff. So the next section is the feather scientist and talking about the really super cool club winged mannequin. Um, and then there's just kind of this wrap up here to think about feathers. So useful interactive, you can pick and play and have them do different sections that you can choose up here, or you could let them go through all of it. Um, feathers through time is kind of fun because they learn about the term dino fuzz, which is just deeply amusing to me. I love that proto feathers are colloquially referred to as dino fuzz. Awesome, okay. Moving right along. Actually, you know what? Yeah, we'll come back here. So now I wanna dive into another of our resources. We have a free lesson available for download from our website. And Lindsay's gonna throw the link to that into the chat window for you all. It's called Jump Glide or Fly Exploring Bird Evolution. And it is uh, a complement to the Flap to the Future Grant game, which you can find on Bird Academy. Um, this game can be adaptable for different age ranges. It's, I struggle to play it because I'm terrible at video games, but I've watched kids sit down and zoom through it while I'm still like stuck on level one, they're done. <laughs> um, so it's a really fun game. Um, and it has um, a lot of really great educational material kind of interspersed with it. So let's go ahead and look a little bit at this guide and then we'll explore the game some. So this uh, first lesson is what makes a dinosaur a bird? <laughs> because birds are basically flying dinosaurs, which is super cool. But of course, we've got to start with understanding what makes a bird a bird. So go ahead and in the chat window, share some features that you think are unique to birds and that help make birds what they are. Feathers, hollow bones or scaffolded bones, bill shape, hard shelled eggs, hollow bones, beaks. Feathers are the most unique things, Jessica says. Yes, I love feathers. Different feet, songs. Yeah, songs are something that uh, we often associate with birds. Oh, Luke. Yes, complex respiratory systems. Absolutely. I love bird respiratory systems. They're so intense. Um, and I'll show you guys a research resource later that will allow you to explore that if you're not familiar with it. 
because we probably don't need to talk about air sacs right now. <laughs> yeah, so let's take a look. Let's see if we got everything. I think we might have missed one thing. Oops. Ah, so we've got hollow bones, or as some people were pointing out, they're not exactly hollow. They have um, struts or uh, supports in them so that balance the strength and the light weight. Hard shelled eggs, somebody pointed out. Feathers, absolutely. Uh, beaks, wings. And here's the thing that we missed, I think, are the two legs. They're bipedal. So, uh, one of the, if something has feathers, as Jessica pointed out, the most unique thing is the feathers. If something has feathers, it is, in fact, a bird, if it's Living. still alive, <laughs> if it is an extant species. <laughs> All right, nice. So, activity one, what makes a dinosaur a bird, does a very similar thing to what we just did. So, it asks the big question, um, what structures define modern birds and then has kids compare and contrast modern birds to their dinosaur ancestors. So they will first start out by identifying some common characteristics of modern birds through some brainstorming and group work um, and then have the opportunity to compare and contrast modern birds with their prehistoric ancestors. So after brainstorming some common modern bird features, which might result in a graph like you can see, or excuse me, a chart, like you can see on the right side here, nice little mind map. Um, you'll notice some things that here that aren't necessarily um, unique to birds, but are common traits that they have uh, that all many modern birds share. For example, not everything flies, but it is a, a on the trait. Um, and then they will have the opportunity to go online and check out another of our digital interactives called The Wall of Birds, which is one of my favorites. So let's dash back to the web here. Um, the Wall of Birds is another Bird Academy interactive that Lindsay will share the link to um, in the chat window. And it is this awesome interactive that is actually a mural that we have our, on our wall here at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So you can see it here pictured in its full glory stitched together from some many hundreds, possibly thousands of photos. So you can see it in its full, full wonder. Um, let's zoom in a little. So you can explore this um, this awesome painting by clicking on different birds and you'll get information about that bird. There was one representative from every extant family of birds. And then these birds that are grayed out are along the evolutionary pathway of birds. Um, and then the ones that are grayed out over here and on the map are what would be considered more modern birds that have gone extinct in recent years. So what this lesson does is it has you brainstorm common features of modern birds and then directs groups of students to investigate certain birds on the wall. So for instance, you can click here and you can find Archaeopteryx. So let's say for the sake of argument that our bird we were assigned is Archaeopteryx we would take a look at this creature and start comparing and contrasting things to modern birds. So what are some things that you notice on Archaeopteryx that are different from the features we listed for modern birds? So teeth, yes, absolutely. Modern birds do not have teeth, they're too heavy. Um, a heavy tail, a tail for gliding that's not just feathers. Yes, you can see that it has that um, central, I'm not sure what to call it. It would be spine, right? It would be like a tail like you would see 
on a squirrel or something, but instead of fur, it has proto feathers or early feathers. Yes, talons Which or claws on the wings. Which there are current birds that have that feature. So Lindsay's pointing out that there are current birds that have a similar feature. Um, so yeah, definitely those three claws, very unusual. There is a bird called the Hawatsen, um, which is a, a bucket list bird of mine that I recently got to see in the wild and I was so happy about, whose young still have one vestigial claw on that joint in the wing because they uh, have a really cool defense where they're in the Amazon and if a predator comes, they will drop out of the tree, just straight out of the nest into the water, swim to the side and climb out using that vestigial claw. With, which I guess isn't necessarily vestigial anymore, but using that, that claw there, and then it will drop off um, as they grow. So Kathy's saying the tail could be called a vertebral extension. Thank you, I never would have gotten there on my own. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, oh Luke, what an interesting observation, a small body to wing ratio. So for a critter that's heavy like this with less extra bones in the tail and heavy jaw from teeth, it's got some small rounded wings, so it probably is not a flyer, but a glider. Yeah. Awesome, so these are all great things. Uh, what I love about what you're talking about all comes back to, um, in a lot of cases, comes back to weight, which is that fine razor's edge that modern birds walk is how to maintain a weight low enough to fly, but be sturdy enough to survive. Cool. So what this uh, activity really does is give you the opportunity to talk about traits, get comfortable using the word, think about um, the traits of modern birds in relation to their ancestors, and start to see um, how this branch, this pathway could lead up to our modern birds. Um, most of you probably know that Archaeopteryx was the first fossil found with uh, fossilized feathers. So it was a big deal when it was found. And uh, Archaeopteryx is technically a theropod. I believe it's a theropod, which is a... It's... Um, theropods are the dinosaurs that evolved eventually into birds. So, and, um, the wall of birds is really awesome for its evolutionary context, but just for um, your edification and other contexts, if you have uh, the opportunity to explore it, I highly recommend it. You can check out birds from all over the world and see some of the crazy evolution. So here's the Hawatsen that I was talking about. Um, this is an adult. And in some cases, you'll be able to hear the sound of them and learn about the family and then see the active range map from eBird, which is a citizen science project. So regular folks like you and me contributing to the data there. Lindsay and I probably put a point in somewhere over there. Yes. <laughs> uh, so really a cool feature to check out. I could spend forever staring at this mural in person or online. So I hope that you will have opportunity to use it in your teaching. So Jessica's asking about the extinct species. Yes, you can click on those too. So any bird that you see on there, you can click on even if they are grayed out. And I like that too. I think it's a really cool um, feature to remind us of, of sort of the history that is still there. Um, some of these went extinct fairly recently. Okay, so Lindsay just pointed out to me that um, about Archaeopteryx, researchers have actually not reached a consensus about its flying capabilities. Um, so whether it could fly or glide or not, but nevertheless, it is one of the clearest links between modern birds and their dinosaur ancestors, which if you have ever seen something like a cassowary or a rhea or an emu in person, it's not too hard to believe that they were once dinosaurs, that they're the closest relatives. There's something in their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. It's activity one.
So the wall of birds we visited. Activity two is where you start bringing in the game. So let's take a quick look at that game. So again, through Bird Academy, Lindsay's gonna share the link. You look for Flap to the Future. We're gonna launch the, launch the game here. Um, what's fun about this game is it takes you through the different, a few different uh, ancestors of birds. So it starts with the Tawa, which is about 200 million years ago, had some proto feathers maybe, had some dino fuzz, uh, on its tail and was a member of the theropod group, which I mentioned before. Um, what this video game does is over here, you can see some different features. You can see leg muscles, flight feathers, which it doesn't really have, flight muscles, which it doesn't have yet, um, but it's got some awesome leg strength. And so kids are really familiar with these types of statistics in games. So they'll, they'll get the point of these bars right away. So let's go ahead and see what this game looks a little bit like. I won't play it for long because if I do, you will see me die. <laughs> but I want you to see a little bit of what the gameplay is like. It is a fun game where you go around and you collect eggs um, and you... Let me see if I can turn off the volume here. All right, so you run. And if you're terrible, you don't jump very well. So you run and you jump and you go through the habitat really poorly. And you're collecting these eggs. So you get a certain number of eggs and you get to evolve. Um, as you're running and going through your levels, you'll come across um, different So here's like a, a checkpoint so you can save. Then there's hazards like water and, oh gosh, I got eaten. <laughs> what and just crocodiles. happened? <laughs> but what I wanted you to see is that there's um, a phytosaur. A phytosaur. So, so uh, it will have little facts like these that pop up, which are really fun. Um, but if you survive this level, the next level you get to pat your inner dinosaur on the back um, because evolutionary, we're all distant cousins. And then you get to proceed to the next level. And there's this little fact in there about um, dino fuzz. So millions of years before birds evolved powered flight, their dinosaur ancestors were covered in fuzzy feathers. Even giant tyrannosaurs like T-Rex. These simple tufts later evolved into the flight feathers that help birds master the skies. So there's little cool facts like that interspersed. Now we're gonna go on to our next species, uh, which is Microraptor, which is a glider. And again, there's cool little facts there. So I won't make you watch me die as Microraptor, but you, you can see how the gameplay evolves. And then you can see here um, how the stats are changing. So the leg muscles are less, the flight feathers are more, but there's not a whole lot of flight muscles yet because this is a glider. Um, so lots of cool stuff. And then later on you can unlock the do, 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 American Robin, which you can see here. Yes, so oops, there is a Spanish version of this game. So um, you can select that at the beginning oh yes you can select that right here under the the start button and play in spanish so here you can see the uh, leg muscles and flight feathers and flight muscles have all evolved to a higher point in the american robin gameplay changes um, and it gives you the opportunity to sort of see how these things are connected, that there are trade-offs in evolution. So here again are your players. You have 200 million ago, years ago, the Tawa, you have the Microraptor at 120 million years ago, and then present day the American Robin. The fun thing is if you survive all three levels, you get to uh, make a future bird, which is a really fun way to play with the stats again. You get to determine 
um, its different features. And that will help bring home that lesson of how things are, how these trade-offs are related. <laughs> yeah, one day, maybe I'll get to the American Robin too. <laughs> All right, so um, the fun part of this lesson here is, of course, playing the game. Um, the, it helps you learn the pros and cons of flight makes clear some locomotion mechanisms and flight adaptations, and helps demonstrate the costs and benefits of certain adaptations. So once kids have played the game, um, then you can direct them back to some of the in informational paragraphs um, and ask some questions like, how are anatomical structures similar between the three species? How are they different? What are the advantages and disadvantages of each of their features? Um, to get kids thinking critically about the game. And that moves us beautifully on to our next activity, activity three, which is create your own bird. Some of you might have seen this activity from one of our other resources. It's uh, very popular with kids. Um, and it really does allow kids to use and apply their knowledge of adaptations to creating their own future bird that's well suited for specific habitats. Um, so kids get to think critically about the advantages and disadvantages of anatomical structures, apply their knowledge of adaptations and functionality and fitness by creating a new bird, and to uh, explain how certain adaptations increase an organism's fitness in specific environments. So this uh, activity has a couple parts. In the first part, you divide group, um, kids into different groups and give them about 15 minutes to create a habitat that they think will exist in 10,000, 20,000, or even 100,000 years. So some kind of future habitat that they think might exist. It can be incredibly different from today, or it could be only slightly different from today. Um, and have them draw it on the paper with some of the different features. So you can see here that there are mountain, Rocky Mountains that's very dry. There are poisonous snakes and it's hot and sunny. So um, the challenge then is to switch these papers among the different groups and have the new group try and design a bird that will survive well in this habitat. So you might get some funky features on birds, which is fine, but you also get some really cool and useful adaptations. So you have these long legs to keep them away from snakes, strong legs and feet that are great for going up mountains, light color to stay cool, but camouflage. So it gives kids a really good opportunity to think about all the adaptations that they've been learning about and have been able to explore, and then think about how they relate to different habitats. So it's a really fun activity. I love doing this with both adults and kids. Um, and now I want to use uh, some of our remaining time to share just a couple more really cool interactives with you from Bird Academy. So I'm going to switch back to the web here. All right, so let's go home because I managed to not get this one preloaded. So we're going to go to all about uh, academy.allaboutbirds.org. From there, we're going to go to our um, bird anatomy interactive. So this is one that is pretty adaptable for different uh, age groups. I've seen college kids use this. I've used it with uh, middle schoolers. So you can use it for something as simple as learning different feather groups. So you can turn on the feather groups here and learn about primaries, which are important for flight, secondaries, um, chest feathers, tail feathers, all of that good stuff, underwing coverts. So you can learn a lot about 
different systems. If you want to get really, really in depth, you can do that too. So if for instance, you want to talk about the super cool respiratory system that birds have, like Luke wanted mentioned, uh, you can bring that up and see how that fits into the bird. And then you can learn all about trachea and air sacs um, and how they have circular breathing. So, or I guess I should say, uh, single flow breathing. So instead of breathing in and out like we do, they have kind of this circular flow going on, which allows them to be really, really super efficient at oxygen extraction, even at high altitudes. So, I mean, you can get really, really in depth here, or you can go to broad things like learning about the skeleton and the sternum, the uh, hercula or the wishbone, um, and get a broader look at things. So this is a great one. Another one I am a big fan of is our fancy nail interactive. So this is a lot more like our um, feather interactive that we looked at. So it's kind of clicking through and um, learning as much as you want to by clicking through these different activities. This one is more about the evolution from sexual selection. Um, so it's a different side of evolution. It's not necessarily tied into flight, but it is really useful. So this is one where you're guessing male versus female, and you can learn a little bit about that. But there are always birds that are going to trick you, like this one. Oh, nope, that's the female. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's pretty fun to check out that way. I'm trying to, oh. Gotta love them. I'm just gonna zoom through here to get to the next module. That one, thank you. Yes, so there's all these different ways to be fancy. You can learn about songs with the lyre bird. Um, and then it actually goes into how these things evolve, um, which has some really great interactive videos in there that I highly recommend. So I won't play them for you, but I'm seeing if I can find the, here we go. So they're animated and they help talk about, I know, why did I find that one still? <laughs> but they talk about um, evolution through sexual selection. Um, and it's really, really super useful. I found these videos to be incredibly successful. And to go along with them uh, is the Birds of Paradise lesson. So I'm going to go to our BirdSleuth website. I'm going to go to free resources. And I'm going to scroll down until I see Evolution in Paradise. Um, these lessons are, let's see, I think I have it right here. Here we go. We'll skip here. So there's three different lessons. There's Science in Paradise, which talks all about um, the scientists who are studying these birds, um, Tom, oh gosh, Ed Scholes and Tom LeMann, who uh, spent the better portion of a decade recording every type of bird of paradise on film or uh, video. And it was an incredible project. There are amazing birds to learn with because they're just so bizarre and so cool. Um, so it goes through sexual selection and heritable behaviors um, and has some really effective lessons to teach that. So if you're interested in evolution and not just of flight, but in some of the more technical aspects of evolution, this is a great resource for you. Again, it is a free download. And that is all I have for you today, talking about all these amazing interactives available to you on Bird Academy. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat window um, or contact us later if they come into your mind. Uh, you can always find us at our email address, both Lindsay and I monitor it. Check us out on the web. Find us on social media. They call it social, but it's actually kind of lonely, so please at me on Twitter. <laughs> um, and thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Quick point of interest, um, I don't remember if this was mentioned or not, 
This webinar is being recorded and all the links I've shared in the chat window will be in the YouTube video description. Um, that YouTube video will be made live on Friday usually um, after we do our other live webinar on Thursday. The other thing, if you would like a letter of participation for doing this for one contact hour, please just email us, birds with um, I'll get you that letter of participation tomorrow if you email me tonight or tomorrow morning. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. I would have forgotten. I Say forget it almost recording. every time. <laughs> Connie, you're interested in of teaching children in the city. You might be interested in our yes. Celebrating Urban Birds program. Lindsay's going to grab the link and share that in the chat window for you. Um, it's actually specifically designed for urban areas because um, it has species that are common to that area. So it has 16 focal species that it uses that are common in city areas. Um, it's Combined citizen science and community activities, um, art and art, and it's bilingual. Yes, it's bilingual, so it's a great, great option. Um, check it out. Let us know if you have questions. We can get you in contact with the folks over at Celebrate Urban Birds. So, upcoming webinars. Thanks, Luke. Thank you all. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Um, Maureen, you will find the links from this presentation on our YouTube channel on um, Friday. Friday. Or if you want them right away, just email us and we can send you the links as well. Yeah, you should be able to see the email right up there on screen, birdsleuth at cornell.edu. We're very friendly, I promise. Oh, that's wonderful to hear, Kelly. It was 10 degrees out and they still were going for it. That's the best. Okay, Connie, I'm getting your email right now and I'll send it to you. And Connie was the celebrator. Yep. Words. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> it was great to see you too, Sandy. It's always fun to see your name pop up in the webinars. So glad you were here. So Please join us for future webinars if you guys had fun. We have these monthly webinars throughout the entire school year. Next month is going to be around something, and the following <laughs> month will be around something else. I know STEM. March, March is STEM activities and outdoors. April is engineering. February is national challenge. The national around challenge. Around student investigations. Yes. So in case you haven't heard, we're having a national challenge around feeding birds. Yes. So it's, uh, we're challenging educators of all types to get kids participating in uh, inquiry investigations around feeding bird behavior. So we're partnering with Project Feeder Watch. Um, and we're also partnering with a couple of sponsors who are putting some really cool prizes out there, like the grand prize winner um, will get their study published in our student magazine and a year supply of bird seed. So if that's something that could help out your program, check out the National Challenge. I think it is birdsleuth.org backslash national dash challenge. So that should be the link there. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and put us on mute, but if you have any more questions, we can be here for another few minutes. Otherwise, we hope to see you in a future webinar or catch you on Facebook or Twitter. Or come join us. Oh, educator retreat! Yes, come join us in Ithaca um, this July. 18th to the 21st. 18th to the 21st. Mm -hmm for four days of just awesome professional development. This year is all about citizen science and inquiry practices, and you'll get to go birding in Ithaca, meet some bird experts at the lab, and really dig in and do your own hands-on projects um, with support from the Cornell Lab team while you're here. It's gonna be super fun. Dash retreat. retreat. I already got it. Just type it in, some oh, retreat. There you go. All right, I'm going to mute us, everyone. Thanks again. We hope to see you in the future.
Okay, I mean the recording. All right, everyone, we are logging.